Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, dear participants of the European Normal Social Algebra Seminar, today we're gonna uh, talk by we're gonna have a talk by Svetlana Zhilina from Lomonosov by Moscow State University. She's gonna talk on the lengths of, of Kuba algebra. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, this is uh, my talk is based on a joint uh, um, work with my scientific advisor Alexander Emilievich Kutraman. Uh, we have a series of papers. So, uh, one of them is already published, and we plan to. Um, and the two of them uh, are at the preprint stage now. So. Okay, uh, first I will recall some basic facts about composition algebras. Uh, and uh, we will first need uh, the definition of the Kelly Dixon construction. So let A be an algebra over an arbitrary field F with an involution. Then the algebra produced from it by the Kelly Dixon process with some non zero parameter gamma from the field is defined as a set of all ordered pairs from. Of elements from A with standard addition and multiplication and evolution given by this formula. So the parameter gamma appears only here. So if uh, the algebra was unital and uh, the involution on it was regular, that is for any element, we had the trace and the norm and they uh, belong to the, to the field. Then the involution on the new algebra is also regular and it satisfies the following qualities. So we define the first uh, our algebra A sub 1 to be as follows. Uh, its basis consists of the element 1 and L sub 1, uh, where we have these elements, where this element satisfies the following conditions. And uh, we define Kelly Dixon algebras over an arbitrary field F. Uh, as a sequence of algebras, which are obtained from a from the first algebra a sub one by applying the Kelly Dixon construction uh, each time. So we had a sub one, and then we applied it, applied it, and got uh, a sub two. Applied it, then again to a sub two, we got a sub three, and so on. So if uh, the field F uh, was of characteristic distance from two. Then the first algebra can also be obtained by the Kelly Dixon construction from the field F. And here the par we have the parameter gamma sub zero, which is defined as false and it is not zero as desired. So we can set the zero algebra A to be F and define uh, our Kelly Dixon algebras as false. So how are they connected to composition algebras? We first need the definition of comp co composition algebra. So let A be an algebra over an arbitrary field F with a strictly non-degenerate quadratic form. Uh, this means that the bilinear form associated with it uh, is non-degenerate. So we do not have here division by two because the field can have characteristic two. And then A is called a composition algebra if the norm permits composition. So we have the following quality for all elements A and B in A. So it is a, a well-known theorem, uh, which was proved by Jacobson for fields of characteristic not two. And then uh, there, there was um, an updated proof for which covers this case also, that uh, Unital composition algebras of an arbitrary field are exactly Kelly Dixon algebras with n at most three. So it is uh, well known that uh, if n is at most three, then an element a in a n is a zero divisor, if and only if its norm is uh, equal to zero. And it is also well known that the algebras a sub n. Uh, are alternative, that is, they satisfy the following qualities. And alternativity always implies flexibility, that is, they also satisfy this condition. Okay, so we will also define standard composition algebras. Uh, let A be a unital composition algebra over F, then a standard composition algebra is one of the following four algebras. So we modify uh, the multiplication on A, um, and change it to one of the four following multiplications. And the first one coincides with uh, the previous one. 
So uh, the algebras of types distinct from one are non-unital. The algebras of types one and four are flexible, and the algebras of uh, types two and three are not. And the algebras of type four are also symmetric composition algebras, so they satisfy the following condition. And uh, the algebras of type one are usually called Hurwitz algebras, and the algebras of type four are called para Hurwitz algebras. And any algebra of type two is anti isomorphic to the corresponding algebra of type three when we map the element A to its involution. So another important subclass uh, of symmetric composition algebras are Okubo algebras. Uh, we define them over a field F of characteristic distant from two or three, but uh, there is another definition which covers uh, these cases also, but we will omit it uh, to simplify uh, our, our talk. So let F be a field uh, with characteristic distance from two and three and consider its algebraic closure. Then it contains the solution as follows to the equation, three X multiplied by one minus X equals one. We consider the Lie algebra of three by three straight zero matrices over its algebraic closure. And we define a new product as follows. So we again obtain a trace zero matrix, matrix. So it again belongs to the Lie algebra of trace zero matrices. So the resulting algebra is denoted by P sub eight of, or, or should, there should be a algebraic closure of F. Uh, and the quadratic form on it is defined as follows. And then an arbitrary Kuba algebra over a field F is uh, defined as an F form of this algebra. So uh, if we uh, if we take its tensor product with the algebraic pro uh, the algebraic role closure, then we obtain P sub eight of the algebraic closure. So this is a definition of them. And uh, uh, why are they good? Because uh, uh, it is a theorem by El Duque, Munch, and Perez. Uh, well, uh, its proof uh, it is contained in several papers, so uh, it is hard to me which uh, to to identify uh, which paper was the first, which contained it. So uh, I list here several dates uh, because uh, there are also several cases about uh, which uh, differ from the characteristic of the field. So any symmetric composition algebra A of an arbitrary field F is either a form of a Paragouris algebra or an Akuba algebra. And any form of a Paragouris algebra is either Paragouris itself or its dimension is two and there exists a basis with a non-multiplication table. And there is another theorem that any finite fine dimensional flexible composition algebra over a field F of arbitrary characteristics is either unital, that is, it is a Hurwitz algebra, or symmetric. So we see that uh, the previous theorem didn't contain the condition that the algebra is finite dimensional because all symmetric com composition algebras are always finite, finite dimensional. So uh, we will also need some definitions will, which concern the length of an algebra. So let A be a finite dimensional algebra over a field F. Uh, then given an arbitrary subset S and M is a natural number, uh, any product of M elements is, uh, is a, in S is called a word of length M. So uh, we consider non-associative algebras, so we have to um uh consider not only uh, the order in which we put our letters but also uh, how the brackets are placed in this product so if a is unital then its unity is considered as the word of zero length and there are no words of zero length uh, which uh, differ from it so if uh, if our algebra is non-unital, then there are no words of zero length. 
No, also that different arrangement of brackets can provide different words, and the set of all words in S with length at most m is denoted by S to the m. Uh, we need this condition that at most m to have the inclusion that s to the m is contained to in uh, s to the m plus one. So we also denote uh, span uh, sub m uh, of s as uh, the linear span of all words in s to the m, yes. and uh, the infinite span is the union of all such spans. And uh, clearly, the zero span equals f if a is unital and uh, it is uh, uh, a zero subspace otherwise. So uh, we, it is clear that a set s is generating for a if and only if a coincides with the infinite infinite span of s. Uh, we define the length of a set as minimum. Uh, of all m <clears throat> such that uh, it's m m span equals to the infinite span and the length of an algebra is the maximum of the length of its generating sets. So in other words, uh, the length of an algebra is a guaranteed number of multiplications which is sufficient to generate a with its arbitrary generating set. So uh, we consider here only some summons. Uh, we do not uh, take uh, the sum of uh, all multiplications, but uh, the number of multiplication in each of the summons. Uh, we will also need uh, the sequence of differences between the dimensions because it allows to uh, uh, describe some concepts uh, related to the lengths, uh, sim more simply. So it is defined as follows. D sub zero is a dimension of the zero span. So it is zero if A is non-unital and one if A is unital. And D sub M is a difference between the M span and the minus M minus first span. So we have the following proposition that the length of the set S is maximum of all M such that D sub M is not equal to zero. But here is um, a case when the set S can be empty or it consists uh, only of zero. And then all, and if the algebra was non unital, then all Ds are zero, but the length of the algebra should be zero. So uh, of the set should be zero. So we assume here that the maximum of the empty set is zero. Uh, the set S is generating for A if and only if the sum of all the M equals the dimension of A. Mm -hmm. uh, recall that the algebra A is finite dimensional, so this is um, correct, uh, correctly defined. And D1 has the following formula, uh, which is clear uh, from the definition of the sequence of differences. So if the algebra A is associative, then if we had uh, an equality on some uh, step of our chain of spans, then we will also have an equality in the following step and the next step again, and so on. So if our chain stabilizes on some step M, then the infinite span the span of S coincides with the M span, M span of S. Uh, we call this property the property of stabilizing sequences. Uh, we will see next that not every algebra uh, satisfies it, but if uh, it holds, then for unital algebra A, its length is at most uh, dimension of A minus one, and for a unit, non unital algebra A, its uh, length is at most dimension. So clearly, if we try to reformulate the, this property in terms of the sequence of differences, that means that uh, for any S and for any natural number M, D sub M equals zero implies that D sub M plus one equals zero. And if A satisfies this property, then for any S, 
the length of S is a minimum of all M such that D M plus one equals zero. However, uh, not every algebra satisfies this property. In particular, it was shown by Alexander Emilievich Kuterman and Dmitry Kudryavtsev that uh, a unital but possibly non-associative algebra over F uh, which has dimension equal to n which is greater than 2 has its length at most 2 to the n minus 2 and this bound is sharp. So there is an algebra such that this dimension, uh, this length uh, value is satisfied. So our goal is to compute the length of standard composition algebras and Akubo algebras of an arbitrary field F, but they are non-associative. So we have to uh, develop some technique to do this. Uh, and uh, this uh, was uh, this problem was also already uh, considered by uh, the same authors. Uh, they considered uh, the so-called classical. Uh, quaternions and classical quaternions, which are obtained from the field of real numbers by applying the Cayley Dixon process uh, with the parameter minus one. And it was shown that the length of the quaternions equals two and the length of the quaternions equals three. So uh, the hypothesis is that for an arbitrary standard composition algebra, uh, maybe with some restrictions, uh, its dimension equals. It's, uh, its length equals the algorithm of its dimension. But the proof of the theorem uses the fact that the norm on the quaternions and the quaternions is anisotropic, so there are no zero divisors, but this is not true in the general case. So we have to think of something else. And uh, what do we do? Uh, we consider some classes of algebras which satisfies the property of stabilizing sequences. So an algebra is called mixing if such products are always contained in the linear span, in the first span of the set P of X, Y, Z, uh, where the set is defined as false, it uh, looks um, very huge, but uh, here are all words of length at most two and only those words of length at most three, such that it's two, they have two fold factors, that y, y, z, and so on, they all contain z. So what we can show that if A is mixing and S is its subset, then for any M, we have the following quality. So we need not consider all words of length M plus one, but only those words of length M plus one, which uh, we obtained by multiplying a word, a word of length m by only one letter from the left or from the right. So we now have not all um, bracket, all division of brackets, but but uh, only some of them. So <clears throat> uh, it can be easily inferred from this lemma that any mixing algebra satisfies the full property of stabilizing sequences because if the m span equals to the m plus 1 span, then m plus 1 span equals to the m plus uh, 2 span. So its length uh, is at most its dimension. So we further consider only mixing algebras, and there are two special cases of them which are descend descendingly flexible and descendingly alternative algebras. So let a, b, c be in a. Uh, we denote by span prime sub 2 of ABC the linear span of all words of length at most 2 in ABC, except for AA, BB, and CC. And we also note that the first span of AB, AA, AB, and BA is as follows. So here is also E if A is unital. So A is, is called descendingly flexible. If for all A, B, C in A, we have the following three conditions. A, B, A and A times B, A must belong to the to this span and such two products must belong to the span prime sub 2. And what do we see here is that uh, in the second equality, A and C are swapped and 
In the third equality, again, an ANCS vector. And a descendingly alternative is considered similar, uh, is defined similarly, but we um, take the alternativity um, equation for to, as, as our inspiration for this definition. So here we swap B and C, and here we swap A and B. So clearly, if the characteristic of the field is not equal to two, then the second and the third equality uh, imply also the first equality. So then we can divide by, uh, take C equal to A and divide by two. And similarly, the fifth and the sixth equality imply the fourth equality. So these conditions, the first and the fourth, are needed only in the case when uh, the field characteristic is equal to two. And uh, we will now uh, take uh, consider uh, some relations between these classes of algebras. And uh, it is well known that any alternative algebra is flexible. However, there are examples of algebras which show that the classes of descendingly flexible and descendingly alternative algebras are not contained, contained in each other. Uh, it would also be uh, uh, natural if uh, for example, alternative algebras were also distant alternative, but this is not true. And uh, distant alter alternative also need not be alternative and so on. So we have the following diagram that alternative imply flexible, but all other implications are not true. So we will also define um, formal M equivalence and solvability. So let M be a natural number of zero. We say that X and Y in an algebra A are M equivalent with respect to some set S if their difference belongs to the M span of S. So consider some words A, B, C. If the algebra A is descendingly flexible, then A, B times C and A times B, C are the words in uh, S to the Ns, they are words of length N, and we have the following equivalences, which follow immediately from the definition of a descendingly flexible algebra. And if A is descendingly alternative, then we have the following equivalence, so, equivalence, so we uh, can literally swap uh, some elements. Uh, Modula the previous, um, Span modular is a linear combination of all words of length of uh, n minus one. We will also say that x and y are formally m equivalent if they are some words of length m plus one, and there is a chain of equivalence between between x and y, which are described by uh, some of the following equations. So. Uh, we will also need the definition of swappable letters. So if uh, S and T are some letters of X and X is a word of a length M in S, then the letters are S and T are called swappable if one of the following condition holds. If, for example, if A is descendingly flexible and X is formally M minus one equivalent to some word of this form, and this means that we have on some, some uh, step that S and T can be swapped. So this um, condition means ex exactly this, that S and T can be swapped. And S is the standard, uh, A is the standard alternative, and X is formally A minus one equivalent to some word of this form. And this again means, means that S and T can be swapped. And this relation is symmetric and transitive. If two letters are swappable and equal, then the word X must belong to the previous linear span. And if, uh, for example, uh, this is um, a stronger form uh, of the previous condition, if uh, X is a length of uh, at most M and for some N, which is greater than the number of letters in S, 
So that is S1, S2, and so on. In X, a pair was swappable. Then X again belongs to the linear span of uh, words of length at most m plus m minus 1. So here is an example. Let A be an distinctly flexible and consider such a word X of length 5. Here we have T and V and they can be swapped. So the they are swappable, and in the case when they are equal, if t equals to v, then we have t u times t as a subword of x. But t u sub t uh, belongs to the second span of S from the definition of a distinctly flexible algebra, so x must belong to the fourth span of S. And here is example of the uh, second condition in Proposition 26. Besides, X is formally equivalent uh, for equivalent to the following word. Here we swapped V and RS. And then we can again swap, for example, T and R times S to obtain this. And then R and U can be also swapped, so they're swappable. Uh, we can see that there are exactly three uh, classes of pairwise swappable letters. And this is not a coincidence, so we will have a theorem on that later. So we will now obtain some upper bounds on the length of descent alternative and descent flexible algebras. And then we will use them to compute the lengths of standard composition algebras and Okubo algebras. So we first uh, uh, have to think think uh, what uh, do we want to prove. Uh, maybe there is a linear bound or something else, but actually there is algorithm bound. So we will now uh, provide an example of an algebra uh, such that uh, it is both distinctly flexible and distinctly alternative and its length uh, is at least it, uh, the logarithm of its dimension. So. Uh, let the characteristic of f be equal to 2. Then for any natural number n, we consider an algebra a over f with the following basis. And each uh, element is indexed by the uh, by elements of uh, this space. So the dimension of a is 2 to the nth, and the multiplication on a is defined as follows. Then it is commutative, associative, unital, and so on. Then for any element A, uh, which is decomposed as follows, and for any B, we have these equalities. So clearly this algebra is uh, indeed the standard alternative. Uh, and since it is commutative, it is also descendingly flexible. So we use here the fact that characteristic is equal to 2. Uh, so, if we take an arbitrary basis uh, in uh, the uh, in the uh, in this linear space, then the corresponding elements uh, of A will gen generate the whole algebra, and uh, the length of this, genera this generating set is n. So the length of an algebra A is at least n. Actually, we will prove a result uh, which demonstrates it, that this length is exactly n, so this bound is achieved. So uh, let now A be an arbitrary descending alternative algebra. We define the set of uh, all, uh, well, we have S to the nth. This is uh, the set of all words at most. Um, of length at most m, uh, and we can have here uh, different uh, brackets. But but uh, we have shown that in mixing algebras, we can multiply only one by one letter from from the left or from the right. So we consider its subset, which is defined inductively as follows: uh, the first one is just S. And if s to the else is defined, then s to the l plus 1 
is defined as follows. It's just the union of S to the L's multiplied by all letters from S by the right and also multiplied by all letters from S by the left, from the left. So we may assume that any new word in S to the M's belongs to the subset. And we have the following lemma that if S is a subset of A, here A is a descendant alternative algebra, and uh, W is a, uh, an element from the set S to the M's for some M, which is at least two, then there exists a word XY where X is uh, right known and uh, Y is left known, where uh, such that uh, W is formally m minus one equivalent to plus minus x y, and there are at most two classes of pairwise solvable letters in x y, and we can list them. So here is a sketch of the group. Uh, we use induction on m and the induction base m equal to to the two to uh, m equal to two is obvious. So now let w be x y. Uh, of length m, then for any s, we have the following equivalence, so we can push s to x, and sw is equivalent to this word, so we can push s to y. In both cases, we again have the words which uh, have the desired form. And uh, the second condition can be proved uh, uh, well, d directly, it is uh, it is not uh, a difficult one. So we have an immediate corollary that if S is a subset of A, then we have the following quality, and thus the length of S is at most uh, 2 multiplied by D1. So here is a proof. Recall that d1 is defined as follows, uh, and then we can choose some subset S prime in S, well, which has uh, uh, exactly d sub 1 elements, and uh, which satisfies the following quality. But then the first spans are equal of S and of S prime, so we can easily verify that the k spans are equal for all natural k, Thus, we may assume that uh, S is uh, replaced by S prime and its length is equal to D1. So let now XY be an arbitrary word in S to twice D sub 1 plus 1 with the length of X equal to K and the length of Y equal to N minus K. By the previous lemma, we have K like pairwise swappable letters and uh, twice d1 plus 1 minus k, also pairwise swappable letters. But since at least one of these numbers uh, exceeds uh, d1, proposition 26 implies that uh, xy must belong to the previous span. And then, uh, since each word, each new word is equivalent to some word of this form, xy. Actually, all words uh, of length uh, twice d1 plus 1 also belong to this set. And we have our statement. But this is a linear bound and it is uh, not uh, very, very hard to prove. Uh, by uh, using some combinatorics, we can prove uh, a strong result. That in this case, actually, the dimension of the nth linear span of S minus D0 is at least the following number. And if we take the minimum uh, of all of these valence values by all k, we obtain the following theorem that if uh, the length of A is n and and it is at least two, then the dimension of a minus d0 is at least this value. So it grows uh, exponentially on the on the length. The dimension grows exponentially on the length, and uh, 
this condition is not very easy to use and to understand maybe. So here is the, the following corollary, which is a, a bit weaker than theorem 32, but uh, uh, it is also very useful that if the dimension of a minus dg zero is at least three, then the length of this algebra is at most uh, the uh, upper bound, um, the ceiling of the of this logarithm. Oh, okay. Uh, we will now briefly discuss decently flexible algebras also, but uh, this case is uh, uh, much more difficult and much more technical. Well, the proof of the, of the case about on, on the distinctly alternative algebras uh, can be written in maybe two paper two two pages, and the proof for distinctly flexible algebras is much much longer. Um, but the main idea is the same. So if uh, let S be a subset of A, which is distinctly flexible, and we say that X is left swapping if it is uh, obtained from one letter by multiplying it from the left or, and from the right, from the left and from the right, right, and so on, or conversely from the right and from the left, from the right and from the left. So uh, the letters uh, x m x sub m minus one, x sub m minus two, and so on up to x sub two are all pairwise swappable. And we have the following lemma that if uh, S is a subset of A and W is a new word which belongs to S to the M's for some M which is at least three, then the word W is a M minus one equivalent to the word of this form, uh, one of them. And here X is left swapping and Y and Z are right swapping. And here Z prime and Y prime are left swapping and X is right swapping. And there are at most three classes of pairwise swappable letters in W. And the largest class contains at least uh, this, this one letters. So the statement is obviously follows from the previous one if m is non divisible by three but otherwise we have to use some parity considerations to prove this and we have the following theorem that if the length of a is n then the dimension of a minus d zero uh, is at least n if n lies between one and two twice n minus one if n lies between three and five and this exponential bound if n is at least six and it is worse than the one which was for the standard alternative algebras but it is still exponential and uh, if we weaken the statement a bit uh, we have the following so the length at first grows linearly and then it grows logarithmically we can now uh, move to the length of uh, composition algebras, in particular standard composition algebras at first. And we can prove that any standard composition algebra is both decently flexible and decently alternative. And if we uh, apply theorem 32 for small values of, of the length of decently alternative algebras, it states that if the length of A is at least two, then the dimension of A minus D zero is at least two. If the length is at least three, then this value is at least five. And if it is at least four, then this value is at least 10. And recall that the dimension of the standard composition algebra is either one, two, four, or eight. So we see that, for example, uh, if the dimension of the algebra is four, then its length cannot be at least at most three. It must be uh, at most two. So it is one or two and so on. So we immediately have an upper bound. And if the dimension is eight, then its length cannot be four or greater. Uh, 
And recall also that only standard composition algebra, so of type 1, which are Hurwitz algebras, are unital. And in this case, we have d0 equal to 1. And for other types, d0 is equal to 0. So we have an upper bound, but we also have to obtain a lower bound from the length. So let uh, A be a standard composition algebra of dimension 2 to the nth and consider such a set uh, in A. If A is of type 1, or if it is of type, of type 2, 3, or 4 with n uh, between 2 and 3, then S is generating for A, and its length is uh, uh, equals the dimension of the algebra. And uh, if A is of type 2, 3, or 4, and N equals 1, there is no um, case when equals 0 for non-unital uh, standard composition algebras, then A has a generating system S, which consists of one element and has length equal to 2, except for, for the cases of the following theorem. Uh, in these cases, any generating system must, must have uh, d1 equal to 2, and then its length equals 1. So here is our theorem that if a is of type 1, then its length always equals its dimension. So this always hold, holds for uh, Hurwitz algebras. If f is a field which consists of two elements, and A is a following algebra, and our algebra is of type 2 and 3, then its length is equals to 1. And similarly, for the case when the algebra is of type 4 and the parameter was 1. Otherwise, the length of the algebra is the maximum of 2 and its logarithm. So this value differs from the first case only when the dimension of A equals 2 then this logarithm equals 1, but the length equals 2. So uh, we now discuss the lengths of Kuba algebras. Uh, we uh, consider uh, two cases. Uh, so uh, it is uh, well known that a finite, in a finite dimensional composition algebras, a non-zero element A is a zero divisor if and only if its norm equals to zero. So Akuba algebras with zero divisors are precisely those which have isotropic norm. So um, it is a theorem by Luke that an Akuba algebra over a field F has isotropic norm if and only if its multiplication table is given by table one, which will be on the next slide, but we also have a useful classification of Akuba algebras with non-zero idempotents, and and such an Akuba algebra, uh, an Akuba algebra uh, satisfies this condition if and only if its multiplication table is given by table one for uh, alpha e equal to one and some non-zero beta, if the characteristic of f equals to three and table 2 for some non-zero parameters if the characteristic is not equal to 3. So these are the multiplication tables. This is the one when there are zero devices, and this is the one when there are non-zero idempotents. So here is x0 is an idempotent, and here is this one. So, uh, there are some particular cases of the field when one of uh, the, the previous possibilities is always achieved. So if the characteristic of the field F is equal to 3, then any Kubo algebra has isotropic norm. The same holds if the field contains the cubic roots of 1. If F is either algebraically or real closed field, then any Kubo algebra contains a non-zero idempotent. Mm -hmm. And if F is finite, then uh, any Kubo algebras both have has isotropic norm and non-zero idempotents. 
Uh, we will also need the following proposition, uh, which shows that any symmetric composition algebra, we call this, that this is the algebra which satisfies the following condition, is the sunly flexible. Uh, clearly, we always can swap uh, these two elements uh, without uh, changing, uh, well, with all previous uh, conditions satisfied. Excuse me. So, let uh, consider an arbitrary Kuba algebra with non-zero item potents or zero devices. Uh, then we can explicitly construct a generating system for, for this algebra uh, whose length equals to four. Uh, we can do this by using multiplication tables uh, given uh, on the on those slides. So in table one, we can take these two elements and table two, we can take these two elements. And then we can just verify that uh, they generate the whole algebra, but uh, the third linear span uh, has dimension seven. So we have the following theorem that in this case, the length of any Kuba algebra or of such an Kuba algebra is four. Uh, indeed, by the, the previous example, its length is at least four, but since it's, it is distinctly flexible, it is uh, uh, it satisfies theorem 36, and since we have here dimension equal to eight, uh, the length of this algebra is at most four, and this bound is achieved, and the length is uh, equal exactly to four. The case when there are no uh, non-zero independence or zero devices uh, is a bit more difficult. So in this case, we always have that the characteristic of the field of the field F is distant from three, since uh, an Okuba algebra over a field of characteristic three always have has isotropic norm. And if o, o is such an, uh, an Okubo algebra and B is its non-zero subalgebra, then either um, it coincides with the whole algebra or its dimension equal to, is equal to two. So one can show that the norm on B is strictly non-degenerate and then B is a symmetric composition algebra. Uh, well, uh, since it doesn't contain a zero idempotence, it is not Perhurvitz. In a, a, any per, in a Perhurvitz algebra, we can consider a per unit, which uh, corresponds to the unit. Uh, and uh, it is always, always an uh, non-zero idempotence. So now it remains to apply theorem 8, which classifies all symmetric composition algebras. It states that uh, symmetric composition algebras are either uh, per Hurwitz or Kuba or some two-dimensional algebra, uh, which will uh, occur uh, in two slides again. So uh, we can also des describe generating sets of such an Kuba algebra that we can see that any zero element generates a two-dimensional subalgebra. The elements x and x squared are always linearly independent because there are no zero devices or non-zero idempotents. And f x y x and y do not belong to the same two-dimensional subalgebra. Then the elements x x squared y and y squared are linearly independent. Uh, so the subalgebra generated by these two elements has dimension at least four. And thus, its dimension equals to eight, to, to eight by, by the previous lemma. So we have the following corollary that the set S, which contains X and Y, is generating for O, if and only if X and Y do not belong to the same two-dimensional subalgebra of O. We can then prove that the set S is generating for O, uh, and if, uh, uh, it, it consists of two elements, then its length equals to three. And we use here again our uh, sequence of differences between the dimensions. Uh, 
but its proof uh, is uh, a bit lengthy. And then we can show that uh, actually the length of the whole algebra is equal to three. Uh, so uh, in any generating system, we can take a generating subsystem, which can consist of two elements. And uh, this can be done by corollary 50. And uh, then we immediately have this statement. So we have computed the length of Kuba algebras, but we now aim for more because uh, there are classification theorems for uh, symmetric composition algebras and uh, finite dimensional flexible composition algebras. So it remains to consider the last case that if A is a two-dimensional symmetric composition algebra uh, from those classification theorem, and there is a basis which consists of U and V in A, which satisfies the following conditions, uh, then the length of A is equal to 2. Uh, clearly, since this algebra is symmetric composition, it is also a distantly alternative. And so it has a property of stabilizing sequences, and we have the following inequality. And the set S, which, which consists of U, is generating for A with uh, length equal to 2. So we have now computed the length of Hurwitz, para-Hurwitz algebras, uh, also, uh, and also symmetric composition algebras in total. So uh, our results give a complete description of lengths of symmetric composition algebras and finite dimension of flexible composition algebras over an arbitrary field F. So here is the bibliography of uh, the re references. Uh, well, this is a paper on standard composition algebras. There are only some papers by El Duque, uh, Mung, and Paris, because uh, there are many of them, and all of them contain uh, very important results, and I couldn't uh, choose which were to be included in my reference list. So these are, hence there are only four of them here. And uh, two papers by Alexander Emilievich Kutraman and Dmitry Kudryavtsev, and our three papers, the one which is published, and the two which are in the preprint stage. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much for your talk. Well, if there are questions, you can ask to Svetlana. Okay, there is a question in the chat. Okay. What could be said about Jordan algebras in the light of this presentation? For example, uh, well, what is standing for this? I tried uh, to uh, consider some Jordan algebras uh, to check whether they are distinctly flexible or distinctly alternative, and I found some counterexamples. Uh, well, I do not remember them right now, but, but uh, generally, then they are not distantly flexible. So uh, we have to maybe consider some particular cases, and then maybe something will be obtained by. Uh, in my results, uh, uh, well, this technique what was developed to uh, obtain the bounds on the length of uh, standard composition algebras and the Kubo algebras, and uh, uh, we didn't manage uh, to develop it further yet. Okay. Okay, thank you. Other questions? I have oh, just a yes. remark. Yes. If I may. Well, first, uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, thank you. Nice and uh, just, just a remark that over finite field, uh, 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 over any finance field. Okay. Thank you, Alberto, for this observation. Uh, pardon me. More questions? Perfect. 
professor mm. uh, okay excuse me i ca cannot uh, uh, i can't hear you very in, in very much uh, quality uh, so could you please repeat or maybe write down yes uh, okay uh, no the, uh, it was just a minor remark that over finite fields uh, mm -hmm. uh, there is a unique uh, Okubo algebra up to isomorphism. Yes, yes, is this it, it's correct? It's just that the norm is isotropic. It's just that there is just one. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I know this. Uh, I will. Uh, um, I will mention this in our paper. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. More questions, uh, maybe remarks. Okay, no. so thank you very much for your talk. And I think we can thank you for stop invitation. our session of today. And I wish you a good week and see you all next Monday. Bye-bye. Okay, goodbye.